like half of our male population out there when I said that Mother's Day is coming up here. I was going like, what the? Well, if you may have scared them, but then they're thankful. They're like, okay, I remembered in time to go get a card, some flowers. Some jewelry like at L.A. Jewelry. Roberts Jewelers. Abs- oh, yeah. Yeah, stop in there. Get yourself some jewelry for that special lady in your life. Mom, daughter, wife. Girlfriend, well, if there's anyone in my mother-in-law in my family who's listening, that Mother's Day is coming. I'm just saying that's a thing you might want to remember. Just saying, yeah. <laughs> Via telephone. Oh, by the way, uh, Tony Petrucci uh, sent me the numbers for early voting as of Wednesday, 2,580. And Matt, you checked with the clerk in Jefferson County about the relative percentage of turnout versus the previous election. What'd you find out? D- just that it was low. I, I didn't asked for a, a I just sent a text just low yeah and asked if it was up down or normal yeah. and it was the response I got was down for a presidential year they're only expecting about a 20 25 percent turnout statewide in this primary I I just that I'm surprised you know obviously what's happening is happening but I was anticipating more excitement and more participation in this election and maybe but it's it's not too late it's not too late. There might be a, a really big turnout on Election Day. Well, pe- what people need to realize, I think, is that because this is such a red state, and for so many, particularly for the, for the local uh, offices, whoever wins the primary is very likely going to win the general election. So this is the, as a practical matter, this is the nas- the, the, the general election. So get out there and, and vote. Don't, you can't. I'm always back. shocked that there's only 20 or 25 percent of the people in a primary who will vote. I, I'm shocked that there's not like 90 something percent voter turnout for every election. I, I, I continue to be shocked by that every single election of my life. And on that note, I bring in <laughs> a candidate for Congress, Nate Kane. Nate, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning. It's good to be on with you guys. Nate, what are you hearing out there in terms of uh, the reasons why this may be a low voter turnout? Or are you hearing otherwise, sir? Well, um, I am hearing that this is going to be a low voter turnout. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, I mean, I know my own personal belief is that this is one of the most sacred duties we have. It's Amen. always been something uh, that's been important to me. And I think part of that came from, you know, when I was a kid, my father used to take me into the voting poll or in the, in the voting box with him. And, I mean, I remember, you know, growing up thinking, oh, man, I can't wait until I'm 18 years old and I can vote. And that there was always this buildup of excitement of this was something, you know, that I got and had the pleasure of being able to do. So I don't know if it is a cultural problem uh, in our country, if it's something that maybe we, we need to find a, a better way to entice and excite uh, young people to get out there. But you know, in West Virginia in particular, I think it was something like, and I'm sure I'm not exact on these numbers, but it was something like 80% or more of the people who voted in primaries uh, were over age 55. And, uh, and and I'm not sure who it was that was saying this, but you're absolutely right. You know, this really, the primary is, for all intents and purposes, it, it might as well be the general election for West Virginia because we are a solid red state. So when you think about the fact that so few people come out that are under age 55. That means all the people who are primarily the ones paying the taxes, they really don't have a say in, you know, in who it is that is, uh, you know, is, is going to be affecting their taxes and affecting those policies that largely are going to impact them. And so I, I do hope that we can change that. I think part of what might be, might be going on this year is that uh, with all of this all of these lawsuits and everything that has been happening against Trump, uh, you know, Trump hasn't been able to get out there and campaign as hard as he has in previous years. I'm sure that may have something to do with it. I think people are are uh, weary and, and worn out um, from all of the just nonstop, uh, you know, uh, the, the attacks against our elections, uh, the 2020 election, the 2022 election, seeing you know, what was obviously, uh, you know, election irregularities. And I think like that, a lot of people have become black pilled. I've heard that, uh, that term being used a lot and people saying, you know, what's the point? But the fact is, is that even if the presidential election, you know, may have issues and maybe may have struggles with you know, some of the other states uh, that are having, you know, problems with their elections, 
We certainly don't have that problem here in West Virginia. Uh, our elections are, I would say, you know, pretty secure. Yes, we have issues just like everybody else does, but not at all to the degree of what we see you know, happening in places like Pennsylvania or Georgia or Arizona. And those elections affect everything down to the, you know, the school board. Uh, you know, they affect it's all down ballot races that are critically important. Our county commissioners, um, all those things, those things affect us on a day to day basis. And so we have to take responsibility, you know, for our own destinies and for our own you know, communities. Nate, why should you be the next person elected to the second district of the House of Representatives in West Virginia? Well, as I've traveled around the state and uh, you know, all 27 counties, I've talked to a lot of people. And over and over, I have heard many, many people uh, tell me that they have been praying for godly leadership in this state for years. And I think that's what I bring to the table. Also, the other thing that I bring to the table that kind of separates me out from the other candidates is I'm the only one that has actually blown the whistle and gone up against the deep state, has gone up against Hillary Clinton, has gone up against the FBI, uh, and has survived to tell the tale. And I've proven that I'm willing to do the right thing no matter what it costs me. And I think we need courageous people that are going to be in there. I also have a very long and extensive career working with the Defense Department, working with uh, our military. I think right now one of the greatest threats to our country is national security. And, and I think uh, we have some major issues both from the standpoint of uh, you know, the, the authoritarianism that has entered into uh, the FBI and into the Department of Justice, the weaponization of government. Uh, I've been very outspoken and have fought against that. I've also worked and fought on election integrity issues and have a, a pretty extensive background on that. But that, that history of working with the Defense Department has given me great insights into the national security threats that we have against this country. And one of the biggest ones is cyber warfare and cyber attack. That is coming. Uh, everybody's talking about it, and they all know it because we are woefully prepared for cyber warfare attacks against our national critical infrastructure. And that will definitely be something that will be, you know, I think uh, it's going to be something we're going to be facing. And I have a, a you know very good knowledge of that. But our military right now uh, is one third undermanned right now. We don't have enough soldiers to even protect ourselves in a two-front war. Uh, there was a heritage uh, report that came out recently that showed uh, that I think the Navy was, or the Air Force was very weak on all four fronts in, in which they measure. Uh, the Navy was very weak on two of them, and I think weak on the other two. Army was moderately weak, and the only one that was strong was the Marine Corps. And so, you know, that, that puts us in a very bad place because we're not uh, we're not advancing, you know, our military to keep up with our enemies. I mean, that's really what it's about. Look, I don't like the fact that our budget has to be as large as it has to be in order to defend ourselves. But I do, you know, I do kind of believe in the, you know, the policy uh, of uh, of uh, Teddy Roosevelt of, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. We need that deterrent, you know, from our enemies attacking us. And the scary part about, you know, unconventional warfare and, and using things like cyber warfare it's very, very hard to defend against, and it's also very hard to have attribution against because it's very easy to hide where you're coming from. So I think we've got some big challenges ahead of us. Obviously, uh, you know, we've got big challenges at the border, and that's a huge part of national security. Uh, we've got big problems with, uh, you know, with, and, and I think the border issue is it's a combination of issues. Uh, it's not just an issue of the fact that we've got, you know, an open border and we have no wall there that's completed. But we also have a major problem with immigration. And uh, and I think that the solution is not going to just be rhetoric. You know, we can all stand up and say, oh, I'll close the border on day one. But you got to be able to convince enough people who are moderates and enough, you know, people on the, on the left to agree to be able to get anything done. And that's something that I've really thought long and hard about. The Democrats are very good about moving the goalposts. And I think Republicans need to do the same thing. Start with the low-hanging fruit. Let's just get rid of the murderers, the rapists, you know, the uh, child molesters, the drug dealers. Let's get rid of those guys and get those guys out of our country, 
and you know and create a policy that says hey anybody that is uh, arrested for you know violent uh, you know crime uh, and they you know that once their time is done they're getting deported and they're being put on a list and if they are ever caught again they're going to jail for life and I think the other uh, the other thing that we could do is then once we've kind of gotten people used to that idea that we're actually going to deport people that are criminals in this country. Then we move the goalposts. We say, okay, now we're going to deal with people who are here that are just using and abusing our system, who have never paid a dime into it. And so we move it gradually, rather than trying to come up with some comprehensive thing that there's nobody on the in the you know that's moderate or, or, or on the left that's going to vote for. We get something that we can get done, and then we move those goalposts and just keep going until we finally get you know what we know we need in our country, which is a uh, you know the the removal of everybody that is here illegally. And at least for those that may be here uh, that are not a threat to our nation, but uh, maybe people who are productive members of society, but they are not here legally, we create a pathway to where they can actually uh, leave the country, go to a port of origin, and, uh, you know, and go through a process to come back legally as, as uh, you know, with green cards. But there's, there's going to have to be a special one because they should not be able to have all the benefits that somebody would have who came here legally uh, the first time. And so that means that their length of time, you know, before they could apply for citizenship should be doubled and they should have to do some community service. So these are things that I think that you got to be able to think outside the box. You got to be able to build, uh, you know, some bridges across the aisle to be able to get some things done, but we can still stick to our principles and we can still say, Hey, we're going to focus on those things that, it would be indefensible for, you know, somebody on the other side uh, to go against, right? You know, I think everybody can agree we need to get rid of all the rapists, the murderers, the drug dealers. And if, if they disagree with that, then I think that's going to be a very hard position to defend. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> Morning, Nate. Um, on May 6th, on your uh, Twitter feed, your X feed, you lobbed a pretty good uh, rhetorical grenade when you led with corruption continues to abound in Riley Moore's campaign. You want to expound on that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, the, one of the big problems that I see right now in politics is all of the money that has, you know, that goes into it. And I realize that this is the way that we do things in America, but it doesn't make it right. Uh, there's been so much money that has influenced uh, the, you know, many of these politicians and Riley Moore being one of them. Uh, but there was an article that came out that said that there was $700,000 that came from some cryptocurrency company uh, that was put into a dark money pool to run advertisements for him. Now, he's already taken money from multiple, um, you know, multiple corporate PACs, and, and I see that as a problem as well. And I'll give you a perfect example. I was uh, hosting a meeting where we were talking with mineral rights owners, and we were talking about the issues that they were having with the oil and gas operators. And it's not all of them, but it's a number of them that are multinational corporations that, you know, they don't have any, any ties to the state. And so, you know, they've been taking advantage of people. Now, I sat down and, and listened to people talk about the issues that they were having with their royalty checks and being consistently paid, underpaid, I should say, uh, by 26 percent on average under market value on their oil and gas. And what was happening as, as I'm listening to this and I'm listening to people you know, tell me the companies that they, you know, are dealing with, I decided to just go look and see, you know, the FECs, you know, what are my opponents, you know, what money have they taken from these different companies? And there were, I think, 13 different energy packs that had donated directly to, you know, Riley Moore. Now, how can he represent the people's interests if he's, you know, if he's taking money from these corporations? And so I think that, and I think dark money and things like that that influence these campaigns, I, I think it's not a good thing. And I think it's corrupt. Uh, I don't believe it leads to actual representation of the people. And I think that's what we need is we need some reform in that area. Unfortunately, uh, the people that have to reform it are the members of Congress who take that money. Well, let and me, I think I, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a hard pill for them to swallow. But <clears throat> I think it's one that we have to actually get done. Well, let me devil's advocate a little bit here. And this is not there's actually a, a question at, at the end sure. of this. But I worked for a trade association for a long time, and a trade association is essentially a, a, a lobbying arm. And what you do is you make contributions to candidates not to influence their decisions, but to make sure to try to get the candidates who are most favorable to your industry or to your position into office. 
So it's that's there's a isn't there a difference between corruption and favoring a campaign, one campaign over another? Well, I think that it's I, I don't have a problem with lobbyists meeting with our members of Congress. That is not my issue. And I don't have a problem with them endorsing, you know, certain candidates because I think endorsements are a good thing. Although I have seen a lot of corruption, at least within our own state, where it appears uh, that certain uh, PACs are, are willing to just, you know, basically let their endorsement be bought. And that's a whole other issue. But I think that what we need in our country is we need greater transparency. More than anything, we need transparency. And the fact is, is that and it's as bad as it is in Washington, where, yes, we know who the lobbyists are, we know who they're meeting with, and sometimes those industries bring very important information to the table, you know, for the politicians. But in, in Charleston, we don't even know who they're meeting with because there's no registry. And so that, that's another issue uh, separate, you know, from that. But some of the things that I think that need to happen, and I've, I've made this commitment, you know, uh, within my own campaign, is that I intend on being the most transparent member of Congress. Uh, and, and doing that, you know, I will record those conversations with those lobbyists. And at the end of the session, when it's no longer an issue in terms of, like, revealing strategy on who we're going to talk to to get certain bills passed and things like that, then those those recordings will be released. But at least immediately after having a meeting with a lobbyist, we can you know give out a uh, uh, you know kind of high level minutes to let people know what we're talking about. That way, at least the media and the people can ask me, hey, you know, you met with so and so and you talked about this issue. Can you elaborate on that? And I will either be able to or I won't. And uh, but at least it's transparent. And that's where I see a big problem right now. Now, as far as the money is concerned, um, you know, the, the article, or I should say the Twitter post that I you know, put out there, what that had to do with was $700,000 in dark money funds that came from a cryptocurrency. Now, there's nothing transparent about that. In fact, we don't know who the, it could have been, for all we know, it could be foreign countries, you know, that are basically funneling their money into these dark money uh, uh, pools. And I, I think that's a big problem. I think that needs to go away. I don't think they should be able to uh, you know, have influence in an election because that's not even a corporation where there's a level of transparency. Nate, we are just about out of time. Uh, you got about a minute, 60 seconds or so to tell people why they should vote for you and how they can find out more about your campaign for Congress. Thank you. Well, the best way for people to find out more about my campaign is they can go to my website at Nate Kane, the number four WV.com. That's N-A-T-E-C-A-I-N, the number four WV.com. And, uh, and I think people have got to listen to their hearts. I think they've got to do their research. But I think when they look at me and they compare me to the other candidates out there, they're going to see something different. They're going to see somebody that's not your typical politician. I certainly am not. And, uh, and I hope that they will, uh, you know, they will make a, a choice to you know, vote for something different than, than what, they've, uh, you know, what they've been doing in the past. And I think you know, it's that saying from, uh, you know, I think it was uh, – uh, there was a saying that says, uh, the, if you keep uh, expecting different results and doing the same thing, that's the, the uh, definition of insanity. So I think we need something different, and I'm definitely that. Nate, thank you for your time this morning. Best of luck to you in the upcoming election, sir. Thank you, guys, and uh, God bless you, and thank you for having me on. Thank you. Nate Kane, second